Hi, I'm Graham Glynn, Assistant Provost and Executive Director for Teaching, Learning Plus Technology at Stony Brook University, and this is Innovations in Education. In our show, we feature faculty and staff using innovative approaches and best practices in teaching and applications of educational technology that have had a positive effect on student learning. On this show, I'm joined by Paul Edelson, who's the Dean of the School of Professional Development at Stony Brook. And we will be discussing delivering online courses. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Is online education suitable for all students? Um, absolutely. <laughs> Could you expand on that a little bit? <laughs> Yes, with pleasure. Um, let me preface my remarks by saying that online education has been the greatest single innovation in learning since the invention of chalk. It, it really changes the whole nature of the educational experience for the better. Now, you ask me if it's suitable for all students, and I would say yes, because students are remarkably adaptive. They learn in small classes, they learn in large classes, they learn in groups, and, and it's, um, I, I don't think, I, I think the issue of suitability um, has to do with whether or not the student um, can accept some of the uh, conditions that online learning um, requires. Mm -hmm. For example, you must be uh, facile with um, using a computer Nothing more, nothing more complicated, though, than um, typing an email message or logging on. But um, I think the, the, um, the most significant uh, difference is that the student has to be willing to, uh, to be engaged, even though they're not physically in the presence mm -hmm. of the instructor or the other students. And they have to be uh, mature enough to be able to work independently. Right. And they have to really, they have to take their writing skills seriously because that, that's the medium, mm -hmm. I mean, for the time being at least. So if you're but a bad writer, you won't do well in communicating and, and well, your grades will suffer. Well, what, what I've noticed is, is that everybody becomes a better writer. Uh -huh. So if you're a poor writer, uh, you, you improve your writing skills because we, we function so much in a kind of oral mm -hmm. environment right. that, um, that writing often becomes a, a neglected uh, art. And I know with Twitter and Facebook, these are very short types of writing. But the kind of academic writing that a university requires, um, it, it's good to, good to give people an opportunity to keep practicing that. And the online learning environment gives them that opportunity. What would you say are the major differences between face-to-face -face and online courses? I'd say the major difference is they don't get to see you. Uh -huh. And the implications <laughs> of that are? Well, um, some people find it to be, um, they're so used to seeing their fellow students and their, um, their instructor. Um, some, stu some faculty circumvent that by posting pictures on the website. But um, it's, uh, speaking as somebody who has taught online, uh, it's remarkable how well you get to know your students mm -hmm. and how well they get to know each other. So, um, Would you say that is even more so than the face-to-face -face Absolutely. Um, as somebody who has taught um, in the evening, and um, th that's primarily our audience right. in SPD, uh, part-time students who are working or have family obligations, who um, it's impossible for them to, w to come to school during the day and even to come at night there are there are obstacles with that too in terms of traveling and uh, somebody performing functions at home uh, for family so uh, that's the population that that we um, prioritize if you will you really get to know the students well uh, because you require them to do to, to participate uh, unlike a lecture class uh, or a small even a small seminar um, it, there are students, I would say, 
my experience has been that about a third of the students are, don't want to participate at all, a third marginally, and then you have a third that really tends to dominate the class. So it's very easy for somebody uh, to kind of absent themselves, to be there physically, but to not really mm -hmm. be a presence in the class. Sit in the back of the room and Well, even at the newspaper. seminar table. And as, an, as a faculty member, um, you, don't, you, you really don't want to be punitive. You, you don't want to call on people who, are physical, who don't appear to be engaged. Mm -hmm. In the online environment, everybody can be at their best. Mm -hmm. And students usually are compelled to interact uh, throughout the course of a week. I should say the primary difference is that for a face-to-face -face class, the instruction, if it's, a, if it's a graduate course, is usually one evening. Uh -huh. That same material will be discussed during an entire week of online interaction. And the, the nature of the faculty uh, member's role um, changes significantly. Th there's a, um, a phrase, it's probably even a cliche by now, Instead of, instead of a, sta a sage on the stage, uh, she is a guide on the side. Mm -hmm. So the faculty member becomes much more of a facilitator than somebody who is there uh, to lecture. When you get tired of lecturing, students speak, then you talk again for another half hour, or even if you have a discussion. It's, it's not as, um, there's no way to hide. Mm -hmm. And everybody is expected to, to fully participate. So I think from a faculty member's point of view, it's a, um, a unique, and if not disarming, uh, experience. Because we're simply not prepared for that. Let me mirror the question. What do they have in common? Well, I, that's the question. That, that, that really relates to each, um, each student. What I'm trying to get here member. is, is the, the transition that a faculty member might have to go through oh, from, see. from a face-to-face -to, -face okay. to an online. What can they carry in with them into that environment well, that will help them get started? The most important thing that they could carry in is their expertise in the subject matter mm -hmm. and a commitment to delivering that material at the appropriate level uh, for the students in the class. And um, I, I think um, and students have to also bring a desire to learn and a desire to commit themselves uh, to the experience. I find that if both of those um, situations obtain, you are guaranteed an optimal learning env environment regardless of the venue or mode because it's the, it's the people that make the experience. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I think a faculty member um, has to be, uh, in a sense, in standing, in stepping back, um, has to know when to come in, when to synthesize or catalyze a, a discussion, or Put it back uh, to on the right track. Yes, and I think with students, um, they can't afford to leave it all to Sunday night, mm -hmm. where they might, uh, in a conventional class, do all of their assignments, because they've got the, because the nature of the online discussion the asynchronous discussion, it, it's a bird in flight for an entire week. So they can't leave it for the end. They're, they're compelled to become more um, kind of involved and integrated into the experience. Okay. So uh, I have to say that for both faculty and students, um, it becomes a, a demanding yet uniquely satisfying experience because of the the excitement mm -hmm. that is generated. The engagement with the students. The engagement. The engagement with the content, even. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you're so dependent, then, on these online discussions and so on, what if you are actually not having a student participate? How do you, in a classroom situation, you might call on somebody, right. but you don't have that power to, to, to do that online. Well, How do you encourage participation? Well, you do have that power. You could send a message, you know, what about that? But uh, students' grade is dependent upon participation, mm -hmm. and that varies with the instructor. So um, fortunately, students are still very grade conscious, and they want to do as well as they can. So that serves as a, um, a requirement, uh, a very effective requirement. However, I think that um, you know, we tend, we're talking about it as if it were uh, an onerous activity. Um, I think it's more appropriate to see it as demanding Mm -hmm. yet at the same time 
uh, very satisfying. Where else does a student, does every student get the opportunity uh, to interact in, in such a uh, complete manner over the I length agree. of a of a semester mm -hmm. with fellow students and um, and with the instructor, you you've, you really get to know these people. And then at commencement, uh, where I hand out the degree, it's a pleasure to meet these students. Finally, to meet them face to face. The faculty that are used to teaching in large classrooms or even in seminars, that it, it's hard for them to to understand or to grasp this abstractly. So well, my feeling is that as educators, as educational administrators, we should try to provide as much opportunity and choice for faculty and students. Mm -hmm. I, I would certainly not want to mandate online courses, nor would I want to require mm -hmm. faculty to teach that. But I, I simply see it as a flexible choice. Yes, another option right. that that um, that gives students more choice and just. Uh, allows people to make progress towards their degree. Now, uh, I'm dealing very often with part-time students, and progress toward degree is, um, is very, very important to them. And I know that for our regular undergraduates, many of them have one or two jobs. So I think you know, the issue of giving them flexibility, whether it be in the summer, whether it be on the weekend, whether it be online, whether it be off campus, it's really important. Yeah. So a question for our audience. How do faculty design good online learning experiences for our students? Question, the answer when we return. <music> Joining us is Patricia Seves, director of the TLT Faculty Center. Patricia, welcome to the show. Thank you, Graham. So how can faculty better design online delivery of courses? One of the reasons why quality in online learning is so important, as Paul mentioned earlier, students can learn in a variety of situations. They can learn uh, out in the field, in laboratories, small classrooms, large classrooms. But when you're working with online learners, consistency uh, and support are very, very important. Mm -hmm. And what really the quality mark for an online course would be making sure that if students are progressing through a program they have consistency in look and feel as they move through it so that every experience they come into in every classroom isn't different it's a new learning experience they have a there's a higher learning curve for how to adapt within that environment so student consistency is important mm. um, Faculty training is important, so they know how to properly use the tools to have as much interaction and richness and engagement with the students as possible. Again, that provides consistency and it provides confidence for the faculty that they're comfortable with using those tools. And it's also important so that we can build that kind of interactivity that students are missing from the face-to-face -face mm -hmm. classroom. Mm -hmm. and teaching faculty and teaching students how to be interactive and engaged in that environment is also important. So those are three, three of the pieces that are important about quality and online learning. And are there a set of guidelines that faculty can use to, to measure that level of quality course design? There are, there are a number of them. In the distance learning or online industry, there are some fairly well accepted best practices. Um, I've seen at a number of institutions some in-house developed uh, guidelines and there are also commercially developed guidelines. Uh, for instance, Blackboard has an exceptional course rubric that they've developed faculty can use. Uh, the School of Professional mm -hmm. Development mm -hmm. has a, a, a set of criteria and guidelines that they want faculty to use. And then there's one that was developed out of the University of Maryland called Quality Matters and that is, is again based on national standards and best practices. Okay. So how can TLT help, faculty help if they want, wanted to put a course online? What type of assistance could you provide them? We have, we have a wide variety of expertise at the university, and we are partnering with SPD to make sure that faculty have, again, consistency between what they might work with mm -hmm. in School of Professional Development, what they can also receive in TLT, and that involves, we have process teams. We've got technical expertise, pedagogical expertise, online learning expertise, and we bring together, depending on the course and the target market and the, uh, the desire of the faculty and what they want to do with mm -hmm. it, we will meet with them, help them to design out their plan, their, their course plan, 
make sure that they've got the proper technical training, and then work with them to make sure that each one of those best practices and those quality standards are being met at every step along the way. Paul, how did you go about developing that set of standards within SPD? Well, I think, um, uh, like most deans, I try to hire people with expertise. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and um, as Pat was saying, that um, I believe in a collaborative model with people sharing and pooling their knowledge. I uh, also, as you would naturally suspect, I'm, con I'm, I'm committed to continuing professional education. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that a very dynamic <laughs> field. If you're not keeping up, you're falling behind, yeah, as they say. I, th I think it. I think it's. Um, it, this is the best time t to be involved with distance education, because of the developments that are taking place, the enthusiasm, the creativity, the innovation, and the fact that it's just become uh, more and more accepted. Uh, I I saw a recent. Um, a Sloan um, Foundation survey that I think it was about 70 per 17 percent of the of, of students now are learning mm -hmm. uh, online, and I think uh, you yourself, as an older student at one time, a part-time student, Pat, were you ever? Yes. Yeah, you could really appreciate. Uh, not only does it make it uh, more feasible for these students to learn, it also increases the number of students who are attending college mm -hmm. and graduate school. And I think for our country, uh, this is a significant issue in terms of getting the most out of human capital. Um, I, 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 um, and I think our new chancellor talks about the efficiency of the education pipeline. Distance learning can play a very important role uh, in that function. I know I was involved in starting the first online school of pharmacy, mm. and we had students. I, I remember particularly one student who called up on the phone to find out if she could get her right. degree online, and literally broke down and started crying on the phone. She was so happy and with so gratitude. excited with gratitude. With I can find I'm place bound. I have an invalid mother. I can't leave and go to campus, but I've always wanted to be a pharmacist. And all of a sudden, that opportunity yeah. is available to me. You know, I think it changes the definition of campus accessibility. Mm -hmm. Um, not just, I mean, if you think of ADA, think of all the other obstacles mm -hmm. that prevent people from going to school. We had a student who was so in love with her horses <laughs> that she, co she couldn't go to college. She, she wanted to stay by her, her, her horses. She couldn't obviously trailer them into the campus, uh, but it was such a big deal for her that, again, online education enabled her to, to get her degree. I think it's an option. It, it gives people uh, access and opportunity that they may have been uh, previously denied. And certainly we want to um, recognize the importance of the full-time on-campus college experience. But the, the nature of the real world as it's changing with uh, two breadwinner uh, mm -hmm. families, okay. um, the, you know, the liberal arts ideal of um, the campus being a kind of uh, a unique kind of special uh, city on a hill that's insulated from the world no longer really exists. I think we need to we need to accept the fact that students are always going to be uh, involved in the, the major activities of life, okay. which include work and participating in a family, and also community. Okay. Paul and Patricia, thank you very much for being on the show. Pleasure. Thank you, Graham. If you have a question for either of our guests, you can post it on the, t the Innovations in Education Facebook fan site. Just search for Innovations in Education. You can also get the direct contact information for either of our guests on the TLT website at tlt.stonybrook.edu. I'm Graham Glynn. I hope you'll join me for another episode of Innovations in Education.